Awesome, Jeb, do you want to uh, quickly introduce yourself? Yeah, quickly. I'm Jeb Hill, and I'm Executive Creative Director at Alchemy X. Beautiful. Did you always want to be a creative growing up, or is it something that you fell into later in your career? Well, I can't speak for everybody else, obviously, but for me, it was just something that I think I was always creative, uh, you know, ways to avoid doing homework, things of that nature, but literally finding creative ideas or thinking about things or finding how things connect. So honestly, Alan, I, I, I happened to, to fall into it. Um, don't do what I did. <laughs> Very fortunate in how I got into visual effects and just the, the creative world. But honestly, uh, when I was in college, visual effects wasn't a thing. And I was often wondering, what am I going to do? None of these things, you know, I'm not an accountant. Um, none of these things really interest me. But in terms of art and things of that, always loved it. Big background in art history, toughest class I ever took. Those who know, know. Um, <laughs> But yeah, no, I kind of lucked out and, and fell into it. It's kind of crazy now that um, people in high school are learning Blender or Max or Maya. And that's a thing. Whereas like for me, at least like in the mid 90s, like I couldn't even describe what it was that I was doing. Like, why are you locked in your bedroom at, you know, in the middle of the night on your computer? And it's just like, I'm doing 3D, whatever that is. So yeah, it's, it's definitely come a long way. That's for sure. Exactly. And, and also, I mean, getting that profession going and I'm sure not for you, but for me, the family, I heard the huge sigh of relief from across the country, you know, oh, I got a job. Oh, there really is something out there, you know. I mean, honestly, I was so into video games, the coin operated, you know, growing up. Um, and I would just, you know, at the mall, here's your roll of quarters, we'll go shopping, we know where to find you. My parents, I hope there's a future in video games. Oh, there is. Um, but um, that's where we are now. I kind of got off the bus at VFX, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's cool. And I was curious too. like uh, for you. How did you first get into visual effects? Like, how did you land your first job? Well, like I said, don't do what I did. Stay in school. <laughs> I realized in college uh, it, it wasn't my thing, I th probably because I was pledging a fraternity and stuff like that. I'm, this is not for me. And so I actually left after the first semester of college, packed up my car from Austin, Texas, packed up my car, drove into the sunset. Mom, I'm moving to California. What? And that was it. So I moved to California and I happened to, uh, long story medium at this point, through mutual connections. I was always into computers, things of that nature, self-taught. Um, just my dad would send me computers. I'd take them apart, put them back together into different operating systems like OS2 Warp Blue, things of this nature. Just really learning like, hey, what what goes on behind the scenes here? Just It just always kind of took, a, took a, a, a liking to it. So. Uh, a, a mutual friend offer, asked me if I would come in and help set up their token ring network. Um, I'm like, sure. I didn't know how to do it, but I knew they didn't know how to do it either. So uh, I, you know, I figured out how to do it. And it was interesting when I was there. He's like, you know, the thing about visual effects is, now this is a while back. <laughs> uh, I, I would say maybe 95, 94, 95. Uh, the thing about visual effects is like, even if you don't know how to do it, just tell me you do and then figure it out. I'm like, but you really just said that to me. Okay. Then he was asking while I was there, um, Hey, do you want to learn how to, you know, do paint and roto this, this, uh, this application called Matador. Those of you know, no. Um, and I was like, not really. <laughs> and he's like, we'll pay you $500 a week. And I'm like, wait, what? Okay. You know, before taxes. Okay, so when you're going from, you know, peanut butter sandwiches and ramen, you know, it's like, hey, this is good. And I didn't really have much else going on. So I got into that and quickly learned that I was not very good at Roto or Paint. Matador was quite an interesting program. You know, you do a one point track, you set it off overnight, come back the next day, hope it didn't crash on your 2K plate. Um, that was one track. You couldn't do more than oh, one. I was going to say so that it took an entire night just to stable. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it, it would, you just feed it Cineon files and you know, you, I hope it worked out, but it was okay that I wasn't okay at Roto and Paint because they gave me a split screen to composite and I knocked that out of the park. <laughs> so I realized, you know, Hey, this is actually pretty cool and you can make a living at this. So that's how I got into visual effects. It was at Tadeo. Um, they had a bit, little visual effects 
uh, carve out, it's, you know, it's obviously a very famous sound company. Um, and then they were later bought by Hollywood Digital, et cetera, et cetera. But it was from Todd A.O. that DreamQuest snapped a couple of us up. And that's how I later crossed paths with Martin Hall. I love that. Uh, that's really cool. And I was kind of curious, like you, you've already kind of painted a bit of a picture there, but just I think for anyone who's kind of getting into VFX now where there's this very defined pipeline and it's so clean and things are so much more complex, it's not hack and slash. Right. What was visual effects to you in the 90s? Like, How would you describe it to someone who was just getting into the industry now and thinks that, oh yeah, it's all unreal and it's all, you know, this and that. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great question, Alan. I mean, it's really changed a bit. I have to take a second and think about it. I mean, I am, uh, if anything, a fan of ele elegant processes um, and intuitive. I'm, I actually now favor obvious over intuitive, but um, like that. I didn't know what I didn't know. Mm -hmm. So going in there, it was quite cool in that um, it was a small boutique shop, very open format. You know, we were using the SGI's <laughs> $80,000 low end machines, you know, uh, literally are, you know, running prisms off a of death side challenge to all those that remember prisms before Houdini. Yeah. Everybody just like, hey, come back into the current century. <laughs> but what was interesting is that, you know, we would have to untar the files ourselves, convert Fidos to Cineon, um, learning these command line tools. There was no, and <clears throat> people that know me will nod. I mean, there was no GUI for anything really. Um, you needed to know IRIX, um, like I said, because they're old SGIs. You need to know command line. And I mean, you had cheat sheets everywhere, but it really actually having to know all the, the pieces from, you know, stem to stern, as much as it was like, oh, I got to go on archive this shot. Oh, I got to convert these files. You're learning. And um, after that, I really appreciated having that, that uh, experience because it gave me a working knowledge, you know, not a, not so much, a, you know, propeller hat, like talk tech, but just a physical working knowledge of, oh yeah, we gotta do this, then we do this, then we do this, and just kind of understanding more. It worked at the time, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, the old saying, a lack of a pipeline is also a pipeline. A lack of a naming convention is a naming convention. So, it, this, it was about just getting, since it was mostly 2D work, some some 3D, a small 3D department. But because we were doing our own prep and things of that nature, well, that was the pipeline. But as things progressed, I had the opportunity to work in, in quite a few different pipelines and had some really interesting observations and things that people might not, you know, some things I didn't quite think I'd find in terms of, you know, some of the largest shops, what you find, some of the smallest shops, things you find. Yeah, luckily I have, I think, worked in some of the most elegant intuitive pipelines, uh, I'd say known, I don't, you know, it's tough. I don't know what I don't know, but I mean, in terms of just supporting the artist, the part, the pipeline would carry the work through and uh, it's, it's amazing. And frankly, it was designed probably by some of the smartest people I've ever met. And what I realized was that really, really, really smart people are comfortable and confident offering the most simple solution sometimes because whereas, you know, if you're not sure you're like, oh, that's way too simple. I'm gonna have to come up with something a little, People are going to think I'm phoning it, but honestly, it was so incredibly simple and easy. So watching how the pipelines evolve, that's something that is very near and dear to me. Facilitating artist workflow and for supporting artists so they don't have, you know, if you want to get into the bits and bobs and do command line stuff and get, be, you know, get TD, hey, good on you. However, we won't, don't want to expect everybody to be that way. And we want to make a, a, just the surface something that supports the artist and getting things through. And mm -hmm. frankly, when, when they're working, like where they take a minute and say, man, this is so great. Like, I love this. This just works, you know, doesn't always happen that way. But I mean, that is the goal. Yeah. No, I love that a lot. And that's me, at least in the early part of my career was my tour of duty was going to studios just because I wanted to learn their pipeline. I wanted to see some studios who wanted to automate everything and saw humans as being the the, the problem part of it all. Um, that was problematic. Everything took forever um, right. versus something where it's just brute force, where you're pretty much fly, flying over on a chair to someone else's desk with a floppy disk, um, you know, to give him yes. a file. That can work, but then you're also having to backpedal on problems that would happen. And 
then also bespoke solutions um be able to build over those obstacles like yeah I, I think that it's the more that you see what works and what doesn't work there's never a perfect solution but i think the more that you get exposed the more that you kind of start to figure out like what works best for you and yeah it's it's yeah. really fascinating i was thinking about this the other day actually that uh working in a shell i realized like 30 years later like we're still <laughs> doing the most brute force things rather than like some flashy interface and all this fancy stuff you just kind of need to use the most primitive way of saying get to this drive do this thing and the GUI is anything that kind of makes it slower rather than mm -hmm. freedom so I was curious with some of the projects you worked on um if you want to touch base on like Armageddon going all the way back to like 98 I think like what was it like working on a film like that Armageddon I love working on Armageddon it's one of my favorites uh frankly just because again uh, you and I were chatting a bit about the fact that at that point Dream Quest when I went to Dream Quest from Tadeo, they had just won, uh, I wanna say they had just won the Oscar for The Abyss. So their model work in that. So in the model shops are just, um, I'm being that I'm in a digital world, I am just flabbergasted and in awe of people that can draw with their hand, you know, actually pencil sketch or craft and make something. Not to knock what we do in visual effects and digital, it's just that, um, you know, seeing people that excel in this other, these other mediums, it's just, uh, wow, it's, it's impressive. So seeing the models as they're made, um, and I'll probably get this wrong, you know, one thirty second scale, one sixteenth scale, what have you of these, like these asteroids and, um, having, uh, just the different high speed gantries, literally in the tech in the stage as they're doing it and learning the actual Cooper motion control, things of this nature, just had an opportunity to learn so much that um, at that time, I mean, that was I'm not sure how long you, you, you can definitely fact check this, but I'm not sure how long after, you know, Armageddon was when we moved to digital from uh the optical days but i mean at dream quest the optical printers were just off to the side with a bin of the markers and everything no, we don't quite use these anymore but literally they were holding doors and you know door stops and such <laughs> compositing on that was fantastic i mean um and that was my background i mean my background is in composite brute force compositing and then i learned technical compositing mm -hmm. and then lighting and color and shader writing etc cetera, etc cetera, once i uh, went on to image works but um at that point it was all compositing the software i want to say was uh yeah and this is where people are going to tune out for sure i want to say it was a uh, composer okay that was alien. composter as we called it but yeah composer and at that point i think alan wasn't it alias yeah. way from at that point yeah, Alias owned it. I think it. they had just combined. I think it came with Maya Unlimited for a little I, while. You can actually get it um, as as Yeah, part. not to be confused with Maya Live. That's a whole different conversation. It, uh, its claim to fame was um, uh, which movie studio was it with like the see the Statue of Liberty or some weird painting, but it was like eighty layers uh, to comp it, and that was like one of the big bragging points. I remember um, that it was the one that uh, composited the. Columbia, yeah, because it had yeah. all the cloud layers and everything else. So that was like it's big. Like we come to the uh, the big logo, <laughs> this thing. Yeah, yeah. So it was it was fun and interesting. The the software was a bit of a challenge, but that's a whole nother discussion. Um, because at that point, I mean, that's when Linux started coming into play, et cetera, et cetera. And um, you know, so it was a lot of interesting times right then at Armageddon. That was right before. The tech came out we started using command line shake and things of that nature but the experience itself was amazing i mean obviously it's a big blockbuster movie so at that point when i was at dream quest rich hoover was liaising uh there for us and um obviously high fo high profile producers and director and such and um, nothing but great experiences there nothing but positive great experiences that could also be because uh that was a time of film so uh <laughs> We couldn't exactly, uh, you know, when you were dailying and, and going to dailies, it was rock, roll, and final. There was no stopping on a frame. Mm -hmm. You'd burn the film, right? Mm -hmm. Dream Quest later got an RE projector that we called the Humbler that you could stop on a frame and it would not burn the film. But um, it was it was really great. And then we 
the several sequences we did like uh at that time rev labridian he works at nvidia now but he wrote the hookah renderer for us and that that would render if you remember the gaseous kind of trails of that look kind of almost like an aurora borealis kind of gaseous effects trails those would take like 16 to 20 hours a frame you couldn't stop them or anything like that but still what he was doing was so far above and beyond anything that anybody else could do he later went on to write the jig render and things of that nature I had like one take of that if i recall i remember reading like uh, todd vizari's old vfx hq uh i lived mm -hmm. that damn website uh because i was a kid in australia so like you know I, I couldn't work on all the projects everyone else was working on so it was frustrating wanting to work in the industry and uh, needing to get a visa and everything else before i could but yeah. Uh, if I recall, um, that whole uh, sequence was kind of like one big, you know, hit a button and pray for a few days and, and hope it comes out well. That's very, very well put. I want to say it was called the Hookah Renderer and it was like Reb, Jim Callahan. I mean, we had all these people that moved, moved on to do great things and we were, that was kind of really where I got into the hey, we're, it's kind of like, and I say this all the time, it's kind of like a jam session, or it's kind of like we're all just sitting around a, an F1 car, just geeking on the engine, trying to get a little more horsepower out of it. And that's where it really got into beyond visual effects of let's deliver this shot, we have these shots to do. Of course, there's, you know, production and planning and all that is absolutely essential. This got more, that was my first kind of peek into the R&D and the kind of like, all right, how do we solve this problem? And that's what really set the hook deep for me in visual effects. Um, whereas, okay, as long as I can output shots and do this, I can also be involved in this next level tech and emerging. Yeah, sure. Sweet. Get my shots done. Make sure I do my, eat all my veggies so I can have the dessert. But yeah, Armageddon was absolutely amazing like that. Some of the things that we did that I later realized like, wow, um, that's pretty groundbreaking. At the time, it's just like, oh, we need to do this or we need to do that. I mean, I we didn't have any kind of lens flare plugins or anything like that in, in Composer or uh, so we, um, we, we used the null filters and After Effects for all the shuttle lens flares. We would, we would pipe them through After Effects and use those at the time. Hey, you gotta do what you gotta do just tricks like that and um we also did the paris destruction sequence so Hoyt yateman had a dream quest at the time and they went and filmed all that and integrated the live action and the explosion elements and and really again to the model shop what fascinated me to obviously i can't talk enough about it but apparently i can just the attenuation of light and understanding the physics and getting the scale properly and the movement and everything it just blew my mind it just how they had thought of everything and clearly this had come from you know the Blade Runner days with Sid Mead and all that art direction and just you know but it was a side coming from digital that I'd never seen so it was like you know it was like what is this amazing awesomeness so again just really cool working with the model shop learning and then you know doing integrating those technologies and compositing those uh the, the work we did it just it it was really uh uh just it it was a great experience. I was really happy to be a part of the team. It's it, it's one of my favorites. So it's it's interesting that you chose that that that, that you chose that one to discuss. Yeah, I mean, it's it's such a in a lot of ways, I think it's quite iconic looking back at everything. And obviously, some visual effects hold up, some don't. I seem to have it all ingrained in my head. But um, yeah, big matte painting for the Paris shot with dirt charges, you know, sequentially going off and like but the whole mm -hmm. thing works, you know, and I think that's the big thing is at the time there weren't that many visual effects films out there so when something right. big was out it's like oh well, let's go see that and now it's at a point where it's just it's not only uh in every film but it's also so overdone a lot of the times that you get desensitized to it so yeah. you're exactly right and it's um i mean everybody loves a good story i think i might trip clients out at times and you're gonna be like wait cut stop tape uh because i'm like does this need to be a visual effect shot why not do it practically why not save the budget so we can really punctuate and frankly if uh in, in most visual depending on what it is i mean it shouldn't replace story as you're saying and really the effect should be invisible uh unless it is about an effect that you're like okay that's a visual effect very well done uh but you know they're there to facilitate the story not not replace it there were always two movies right so you had armageddon but then there was deep impact you yep. know or then volcano but then dante's peak you know and there was always like are we which one are we making and then dd's doing the other one or what and i say that with respect they do great you know i work there as well they do great work so 
but yeah, yeah it was funny it was like that. there's always two of these i think one would validate the other it's like okay someone's willing to pump 80 million dollars into this so let, let's you know green light our script and try to race it out before them and even exactly more and that and theirs has morgan freeman so we really need to polish this one this has got to be good folks yeah <laughs> but even more recently uh was the white house down and the other one uh you know it, it's become a thing again where it's just like let's race out our film before theirs so that way mm -hmm. you can exhaust the audience and they won't want to see the other so i'd love to talk about some of the more uh recent things you've done but talking also about um sony image works first time i stepped foot in there was probably 2006 just to have lunch with a few friends on beowulf which um you know was at the tail end of that but for yeah. you what was it like going in it was like 99 i think to 2007 something like that yeah, that's exactly right. It was such a magical time uh, being there. And uh, I went over, um, let's see, from Dream Quest and doing some stuff there. And then behind the scenes, I got a, uh, I started getting into, 3D tracking wasn't a thing. Mm -hmm. So I started messing around with little Cartesian geometry and math and stuff. <laughs> but ultimately mapping 2D points to 3D space and started leveraging Thad Byers Raz Track, Hammerhead Software, Raz Track. And I started showing on Inspector Gadget how you could use that to I think we have that in common, a little Inspector Gadget action. But how we could use that to track for his arm and things of that nature. And it really opened up so many possibilities for you know 3d tracking and at that point imageworks was like hey we're making hollow man do you want to come over here and do some 3d tracking for up I'm like sure um yeah that sounds awesome um and that wasn't really an area that i was planning on delving into frankly it was just an area that i could help there were a couple shots and so you know long story short just getting into motion control and you know finessing and things of that and and I just started realizing, hey, this is an area that not a lot of people are looking into, frankly, because it's kind of tedious. And if it's somewhere I can show value. So that was something that I then did on Hollow Man and going over there, but it wasn't really about the tracking. I mean, there were just brilliant minds there. So I immediately just started asking questions from everybody until they told me to go away. And I just come back the next day and ask some more. It was really about the imaging and such. So I'd mentioned uh, technical compositing as, the pro as opposed to brute force and understanding what the operators did and things of that nature. And when I was at DreamQuest, I had the opportunity to work with somebody who's like, hey, you know, you can't use overs, you can't use any of these binary operators. Every single thing you do in comp has to be done with an arithmetic node. So you can show me, you know what's happening in those pixels, you're controlling them and you can speak to them in dailies. I was like, I didn't realize at the time what how crazy that was. So I was like, okay, I'm in. And that's where I started understanding the imaging side. So when I went to Imageworks at the time and they're like, hey, if you're a comp or uh, if you're a compositor, you need to know color and lighting as well. We'll teach you shader writing. And I realized, hey, this is just kind of shader writing. It's just kind of like command line compositing. <laughs> you're putting these things together and all that stuff. And it really helped so much in terms of I'm going somewhere with this in terms of learning the photo photometric theory and understanding the way that light works and understanding, you know, there was one point where we had a bunch of sequences and it was, we were just not getting things out quickly enough. And so it's like, Hey, why don't you, know, why don't we render with, uh, just neutral light shader values of, you know, of, of 18%, you know, so just balanced then we can do the intensity with one grade node in comp and the color with another one, pipe that back into our, you know, into our scene. And if all is well, we get the same result and we could quickly start doing dev and things of this nature and just leveraging things. But what it also was happening, we were getting into exciting things of global illumination. I mean, man, uh, you know, shadow maps and deep shadows and all of this, they were filling up our servers. We weren't ray tracing. Um, we were probably the largest, I think we might've been the largest consumer of RenderMan licenses, Pixar licenses. And we're like, why are we paying our top competitor and using their software 
That's when Arnold came in the door. We started looking at Arnold. Yeah, Mako uh, and Mono 9, actually, uh, I was a buddy with yep. him and he was riding it for 3DS Max and then, yeah, he disappeared <laughs> somewhere. Yep, right? exactly. So we started looking into that. We had, you know, part of developing Katana, part of developing Open Image IO, part of developing Open Color IO in terms of, you know, I would just go ask Jeremy Salon all kinds of questions all the time about, you know, and, and color is ultimately one of the things I ended up getting into just proper color. That's another kind of like tracking. Nobody wanted to touch it. <laughs> <laughs> it was such an amazing time, Alembic, all these things were going on. So as well as doing shots, it was about, okay, uh, can we get the same result from an AMD and an Intel chip? Can those renders look the same? Can we pipe our software into this so we can go to anywhere? How can we really get into full, embracing full Linux uh, as opposed to the older IRIC solutions? How do we get into ray tracing, do it effectively? How do we, you know, yeah, you know, they, they have their own special flavor cut of Arnold. I won't get too much into that. But, you know, like Framestore, they have their own flavor of Arnold that that they do, but it was just such an amazing time to be there and all the minds and the ideas being thrown about. So the shot work was great. The skunk works was better because just being part of those development groups and seeing what's going on behind the scenes. And I didn't realize what an amazing resource it was until, you know, I still continue to think like, wow, that's really amazing. And I've, I've, I, I'm so grateful. I've been very fortunate to work at some amazing places and even going to those other places and working with other, you know, luminaries are like, wow, you worked back there. That was awesome. Tell me about it. I'm like, wow. So it was, it was as special as I think it was. So it's just, I just really lucked out. And um, again, I'm, I'm really grateful to all the people that take the time, took the time to just share things with me. It was pretty amazing. I think that's one thing, like you kind of hinted at it at the very beginning of our conversation when it comes to visual effects, like, in my mind, it is problem solving. It's what you're saying before about, you know, figure it out. Don't tell anyone you don't know and figure it out. It's, it is exactly that. Like nobody's coming in. If, if you are coming into a project with, oh yeah, I know how exactly to do that. Then I feel pity for the projects you're taking on because there's no innovation there. Whether it is even just doing a, a spotting session and saying, oh, the, the samurai gets cut in half and he falls off the horse. Well, we'll keep the plate legs and we'll do a CG torso and having that fun of being able to break it down and, and deconstruct the shot before it's ever made like that in a lot of ways is is the the hard part but also the fun part so like what's yeah. your views on that is from a problem solving perspective i think you're exactly right there's no such thing as a magic bullet or a panacea you know cure-all we work and we gain experience and i think for me uh, i assume it's the same for everybody as we do a spotting session, we might liken it. Oh, this is similar to, oh, uh, we could approach this like, but literally, and that's part of a key pipeline is we never assume everything's the same. We, it's not about avoiding the bumps in production. It's how we deal with them that makes all the difference. So taking a look at an effect, taking a, and really listening to the goals, what, what the creative goals are for it and figuring out um, you know, also the client, sometimes it's a matter of, I need you to execute this vision. Okay. The other times it's, we're a creative partnership. What do you think? How can we make it even better? And it really is like you just said in a spotting session, looking at it. And of course you have your experience, but you don't have any preconceived notions. It's, there is no, uh, just add water, you know, just add hours and boom, the effects are done. I'll throw this at you as well, and I think you know I'm going to say this. It's not only about how it's done, it's the important thing about a project and ultimately the thing that really makes it worthwhile. There are some high profile projects that we could all work on, but ultimately at the end of the day, what people remember is how they felt when they worked with the team mm -hmm. and the experience they had while doing that. The team and, and how like discovering those things and uncovering things and what and like solving problems it, that's that's it feels so rewarding and wow we hadn't done it like that so the pipeline are going in of knowing okay we have something that is kind of a, a backbone but how do we put these tools together to facilitate this particular creative goal that to me is is super fun because you have these tools and you can reach them in different ways but ultimately it's about 
efficiently reaching them, smarter, not harder. There's definitely been projects where I've, I haven't done this in a long time, but like where the whole team is working at three in the morning trying to get to a deadline. And there are some of the hellish times I've ever been through, but then there's been projects where it's been exactly that. And they're some of the best times of my life. And it really comes down to whether you're doing it because of a bad decision made up top or, you know, whatever situation you're running into, or it's all of you combined trying to like do something great. And I think that when it is for the right cause, that's when, yeah, it's, it's these memorable sessions of trying to hit a goal that you're all aligned and trying to do together, even if it is rough at the time, like you still look back with fond memories. Exactly. I mean, it may be that one facility shut down and you're working somewhere else that just got charged with uh, finishing, you know, eight months of work and two months. Or they cut 30 minutes out of a film uh, six weeks before Superman Returns is coming out, <clears throat> which I know Sony was on as well. So, <laughs> Or you're working on a Marvel film and it's the last week and maybe the top execs, I'm not going to use names because it doesn't really matter the the top the top brass hasn't looked at it yet and oh and this is stereo and we have notes <laughs> just the pivot actually um again i want to respect your time but uh polar express like curious when you're talking stereo uh <laughs> what was that experience like let's say it was amazing a lot of trauma bonding and i say that the film the project was amazing i mean the 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 technology there in terms of the performance capture and things of that nature i realized it was a very particular process at that times and everybody you know a lot of great minds on it um so uh just the amount of work and in terms of the shader writing and imaging. And there was so much going on behind the scenes that we were learning in terms of retargeting characters, working, figuring out physiognomy, what works, what doesn't, what works on paper, but doesn't work on the screen, you know, things of that nature. Again, so many, so many, uh, just great disciplines coming together. And at the same time, at the same time, you know, we're in dailies and I'm like, hey, what about the eyes? Quiet down, Hill. OK. <laughs> Actually happened. <laughs> Animators were not a fan of, of my saying that, but I get it. And it was like, hey, that's the but I said something and, and we very much operated at ImageWorks. Um, can't say they still I mean, maybe they still do. Great place. I have nothing but great things to say about it. But it was like, hey, if we're in dailies and, and, and you know, New York City subway rules, you see something, you say something. That is something that really changed uh, over my career that I found very powerful in terms of coming up and thinking that I need to be able to pick every single piece of pepper out of nap poop and show that I know everything. And I think that or not know everything. Nobody, nobody likes that, but meaning like, oh yes, I see what's happening here. So I can speak to everything versus as I went on in my career and learned more, some of the top, you know, considered and are some of the top visual effects supervisors in the business. I realized that didn't go very long way with them. And it was, why are you looking there? Really? There's only three notes you need to give at any time. And this totally different style of supervision that really led to so much more amazing discoveries, just better work, frankly. But again, I, I digress. It was just like, oh, I thought I had to show I was paying attention in my work by picking out every single thing that was wrong versus what are you doing? Why are you even looking there? worry about right here, you know? And so I realized you didn't ask about that, but that is something that really changed uh my approach philosophy and as a result I, I could immediately i could immediately see how it changed the work dynamic of teams that i was a part of so i'd love to hear more about that like for you what is your philosophy when it comes to supervising um like for you what are the golden rules that you typically stand by yeah like you're able to get the best out of everyone other the golden rules other than budget and schedule seriously every conversation i fucking have with a client like doesn't matter how important they are it's just like okay what's the budget and what's the calendar it's like if those two don't line up then it's like i'm not able to take it take it on so yeah yeah i love your ideas uh and yeah so w when the rubber hits the road really it's about the team alan it's about the team it's um having a clear vision on what we're looking to execute for the creative uh for the brief 
of, of what we want to get and telling that story um, and really about working together as a team and appreciating the contribution of each department. Uh, I'm very much about the gestalt. The, the output is greater than the sum of its parts. It really makes such a huge difference working together um, and not brute forcing it. Um, and having a team that's passionate about the creative and running together at the same target uh, and being creative and 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 uh, with your ideas and able to call an audible on the fly of like, yeah, we got it and great teamwork just so you can do the behind the look, the no look pass and know that that person's going to be there for the alley-oop or what have you. Um, and being able to execute that level, a skillful execution I mean, ultimately the thing uh, that that really makes a difference, this is the secret. I could tell you making effective use of dysfunctional relationships is the secret to success, because that is important. But ultimately every member of the team, knowing that they're a valued member of a winning team on an inspired journey, that makes a difference. Yeah, it's so critical. And I, I honestly feel that it changes everything when you're, especially leadership, like especially as an artist, if you're working for, a supervisor who just shits all over you or shits all over your work or yeah. doesn't care about what you can contribute to it. it just it it changes everything but at the same time leadership is what ultimately you've got a boss and they've got a boss and you've got to align everything that you're doing with their vision so it's yeah uh, so important it's make or break um bad leadership when it comes to any big production you were saying the word leadership and that's a key i mean it's such a subtle difference you haven't said the word management, you've said the word leadership. And that's a key. I'm always looking to work with leadership, not management. Want to be a leader, not a manager. Yeah. I won't name the studio, but a good friend of mine, he's a VFX super at Marvel now. He's at he's a comp super at DD at the time, then he left to go mm -hmm. somewhere else temporarily. And this is the studio I won't mention, but uh they're working on a big project and the VFX supervisor is like two in the morning, pulled everyone together and it's just like, hey, everyone come over to John's desk. And um, this is an example of what not to do, you know, and <laughs> that's the kind of shit that for that person is crippling. But for the whole team, it's just like, this is who we're trying to people please, like, you know, opposed to someone who you're willing to, to go above and beyond and um, do what it takes because you're you're helping them because you believe in them and yeah, that's uh, person. Well, hey, uh, that's not even okay at 2 p.m. 2 a.m., you're really pushing it. Yeah. You know, talk about disparaging and a great way to just take the wind out of this. Anyway. But yeah, so I mean, that's that's definitely something to your point is like, yeah, that, that can be very tough on the team. And that can have lasting, damaging just throughout. So just trying to make sure that everybody understands and knows they're appreciated and there is a direct connection to their contribution. And really, Alan, it's about skill-based management, right? PMOC, plan, motivate, organize, and control, quality control, quality control. And that's all Peter Drucker and, and understanding skill-based management versus we don't make widgets. We are not button pushers. You hire us for our opinion, believe it or not. Now, you might wanna narrow that down and just say the opinion about the artistic work, <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately that is what makes um being an artist and a creative fun because we do kind of operate outside the normal guidelines um not that being a banker or an investor or something isn't interesting and creative it's just we're a little more wacky so to speak you know we we're we're, we're supposed to kind of go off the beaten path to find things and find solutions and come up with new ideas and and that's something that I think is is just that that that's really motivating to me. That that's what makes it fun working with the team and finding these solutions together and facilitating reaching levels. Technology for me is framework to uh, allow the team to just paint higher up the mural, higher up the wall. Uh, technology for technology's sake, no. The elegant implementation that helps drive the artistry further and helps uh the team feel like i couldn't even do this before and now i feel like i'm limitless that's the key right there for me you mentioned pete drucker so what gets measured gets managed at the same time talking about framework as well like how important do you think it is for artists in the evolution of coming into this industry to 
further down the line to really start to um, track their progress and, and what they're doing and have a, a clear idea of like where their mistakes are self-manage if anything and self-reflect a little bit um I, i'll say just with context that for me like there's definitely been parts of my career that i've had massive growth spurts and usually it was when i was able to start looking at things through the eyes of the other person like paying attention to my supervisor and the notes that they're giving me and anticipating like okay like i want this but they want this so what am i going to give them i'm going to give them what they want not well, I think it's better this way. Uh, I can give them that permutation, but you, you get where I'm getting at. So I, I'm just kind of curious oh, yeah. what your thoughts are. I absolutely know what you're getting at. And that reminds me of a very wonderful learning lesson that one of my CG soups, um, and it wasn't easy. And I, uh, I kudos to him for how he went about it because I was very much uh, like you're saying, oh, I got these ideas and let me do that. I hear what you're asking for, but um, uh, the thing is this, um, just like working with the best pipeline people. Hey, I hear what you're asking for, but let me tell you what you really want. And here's why that's great. Uh, from pipeline with this supervisor, uh, the wisdom he imparted on me was like, Hey, look, we have a lot of really smart people on a team. I feel lucky supervising you all. And I see that you have a lot of great ideas. Do me a favor. If there's something you want to try, try it. Mm -hmm. And the way to really sell it is if there's something that was asked and you had another idea, go ahead and execute what we asked and then try what you want to try and then show what we asked. And you might find what you tr want to try works better or worse or an alternative, but always go ahead and, 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 and I know it's going to be tough in the beginning, but you'll find that people really start listening to your ideas a lot more because you're participating in the game. So when we, you know, if we give a note, even if you think, oh, that just looks awful, go ahead and do it and execute it to the best of your ability. Um, and uh, then go ahead and do your version. And then if you decide to show yours and the other one, great. And if not, well, hey, good news. You have the one that we asked for, so great. So I think it, it was just such a, you know, and telling an artist that honestly, putting my uh, leadership hat, it's not easy. And the way he went about it, um, I really respect it. Like I, I really do. Um, and he was a supervisor that at the time, um, you know, maybe it's because I was new to the industry, newer to the industry. I was just like, oh, you know, just very nervous and and things of that nature. Yeah, and that really made a huge difference, as you said, like great ideas. Let's execute what's asked. And then if you're like, hey, I did this other version because I saw this, but I don't know, what do you all think? And I found that to be a, a really valuable lesson. Yeah, I, I love that. And those are the kind of lessons that you take with you your whole career. Jeb, this has been awesome, um, really insightful. And yeah, I wanna thank you for taking the time to chat. Uh, if there's any additional things you wanna add in or places to go to follow you, uh, your studio, um, yeah, like feel free to, to add those now and I'll add them into the show notes. I mean, I have my own company, but I'm not here to try to, to give a shout out for that and doing things. Ultimately, it's it's technology. So it's um, alchemy, alchemy-x.com is where we're currently uh, spinning up the latest and greatest. And we're actually working on something that I really feel uh, it's a industry disruptor. Um, it's going to change the way people work. Those are big words, right? Very few times could you ever say good, fast and inexpensive, never cheap, inexpensive good fast and inexpensive you can have all three so now that's a a very general term but um there's a lot of a lot of amazing tech out there a lot of a lot of uh smart minds have gone to games and i feel our industry is very much now about a lot of studios are striving to maintain a button on a shelf rather than thinking about what's beyond it what can we do now things of this nature so in the next I want to say there's going to be some exciting uh some exciting developments that we're going to be rolling out at alchemy that um kudos to the team it's really exciting so i'm all uh, I'm, I'm i'm looking forward to telling you more about it i can't say much more right now um but i uh i will definitely uh tell you all about it in the future i look forward to it absolutely jeb this has been great thank you so much alan my pleasure thanks for your time it's wonderful chatting with you and um Love to come back anytime.